Now, hello everybody, welcome, it's 3.30 p.m. Eastern, 1.30 p.m. Pacific, welcome to I Got Next, Games Radar's weekly talk show, wherein we talk to people who do things that we find very, very freaking cool. My name is Anthony John Agnello, uh, Senior Social Editor at Games Radar, and with me today is Ashley Reed, Editor for Games Radar. Hello, Ashley. Hello. And I asked Ashley to join me on the show today because she, like myself, is a comic book nerd. And, oh, is that uh, what? That's, is that what? I was that, curious. That's what this is all about, Ash. I wanted you here to talk about comic books because I don't know if you know this or if the people at home watching know this, but in, in the vast pantheon of the last 30 years of Transformers crap that exists, uh, most of it's terrible. I, I mean, I grew up watching the old cartoon, and it, it, it was not great. It was not great. I mean, there are episodes of it that are pretty cool. But, like, the idea was always cooler than the actual thing. There's, well, still, there's still a picture in my mind from Beast Wars of a che of a ch the cheetah beast war guy i can't remember which one that is reaching out screaming dramatically as another transformers life force is sucked out that is in here forever yeah we hear when i am old and have forgotten most things you gotta have that in your soul and see like beast wars was on the the good end of the spectrum for like for, for transformers stuff like beast wars <laughs> is the good cartoon Apparently, I haven't watched that much Beast Wars. Uh, hello, Hoplon42, and hello, Caleb Zale Xavier. And Caleb Xavier here in the chat Ash, says something that is, is why we are here today. He says, IDW has done really good. And IDW is the comics publisher that puts out Transformers comics today. So, in this vast, like, two generations, and I mean, like, actual generations of time, not when you get into transformers dorks there's a whole like people say first gen and all of these other things there's like terminology to refer to which transformers you're talking about gen one uh <laughs> so like if you talk about like the new transformers Dev devastation game by platinum that's gen one so okay all right so in all of that stuff in all of the video games and all of the crap Michael Bay movies and the bad cartoons and all of that, there have been some amazing comic books. Amazing, amazing Transformer comic books. And back in the late 80s and early 90s, there was this awesome, like, it was Marvel UK. Not proper Marvel in the US. It's their, their UK offshoot. Not, the real, not, not, the not a real one. Uh, but, like, that kicked ass. That comic book was great. A lot of the ending of it didn't even come out in the U.S., so a lot of people miss out on those issues. Uh, but starting, I want to say, and, and Caleb Xavier in the chat can, can back me up on this, and we're going to talk with our guests more about this. I would say starting about five years ago, IDW started putting out Transformers comics that are freaking crazy, that are insane. They're so good. And my favorite of these comics is Transformers More Than Meets the Eye. Now, Ash... I already love it. I already love it. Let me, let me put this in your head. So what would you say Transformers is about? Like, if you, if, you, if you had to describe Transformers for a human being, what would you say? Uh, robots turn into trucks and airplanes. All right. Perfect. And sometimes, sometimes gorillas. And like, you'd probably say like maybe like some like dumb toys, you know, some dumb, some toys, some like some Michael Bay bullshit. Like that's that's what's yeah. happening out there when you when you hear the word Transformers. Tra yeah. Transformers Wait, more than more than meets the eye. The comic. I, I, every now and again, I'll go on a jag of reading it, and I have to explain to my like I, I try to explain it to my wife what it is. And I tell her that it is a political and religious drama about what it means to be in a mortal life form that is recovering from a period of war that defined your entire species. 
that is what this comic is about. And that's not even the pretentious description. <laughs> that's just it. Like, that's the midline, you could go way more pretentious description. Yes. I, I, could get, I could get crazy pretentious. That's just what, that's the literal, that is the back of the box quote. <laughs> For Transformers more than meets the eye and and the the cat who writes it is a dude by the name of James Roberts and I honestly prior to today I'm still not convinced James Roberts is a real person I I, I cannot believe that there's somebody out there that's like oh you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna I'm gonna write e extremely soulful weird insane uh, comic books that are about trucks that turn into people. And do you, and do you think he is? Do you think he is actually a transformer himself? I don't know. And I don't know what his deal is. Getting his information. I don't know. I don't know how he does it. I don't know what his deal is. But we're gonna talk to him about it. He is joining us today. He's gonna he's gonna be with us in just about twenty five minutes, starting at four p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, but in the meantime, you and I, you and I can talk about what we actually look for in awesome comic books, and also we can talk about this awesome Transformers game that I'm playing right now. If anybody's curious about which Transformers game this is, this is the self titled This is just Transformers. It came out published by Atari. Came out in 2004. Do you read me? For the PlayStation 2 only, and it's actually really good. It's 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 awesome. It's actually one of the a great few. game. One, one of, of the few. I would say probably the only Transformers game that I have ever played that I think is good. And I have to remember how to play because it's actually really hard. <laughs> I feel like you have to really you have to really love Transformers to do it justice like this because it's it's definitely a very strange concept that's very easy to mock. Yeah, it, it really it's, is. Yeah. In mocking it, it often comes off as, you know, very not good, <laughs> very <laughs> cynical and sad, I don't know, very right. unpleasant, very explody. Draw, drawingist Musashi here in the chat has reminded me that another part, another essential part of Transformers uh, more than meets the eye is drinking in a bar. Uh, really? I, I, I would say that 25% of the entire series takes place in a bar and involves robots that turn into cars getting hammered and talking is about time like, travel is this a very large bar it's, like it's, it's pr pretty big it's a big that bar. you could park several trucks in well it's in it's in it's on a spaceship and the spaceship the spaceship is traveling throughout the universe with a crew of misfit transformers who are trying to find what are essentially like a cross between the mechanical equivalent of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table and the Apostles. You, you, okay. You, you keep up. Keep up, Ash. Come okay, on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was taking too much brain power. I'm I'm used to Transformers being explosions and slow mo camera spins. This is gonna take some time. Me too. It's a whole, it's a whole, it's a whole It's a whole world. something else. It's a whole Some, thing. Something very un ish <laughs> It's distinctly... Oh, all right, Drawingus Musashi has told us that the, the Lost Light, the spaceship I was just explaining, is 15 miles long at least. So oh, there damn. you go. It's a 15-mile long spaceship. Okay, okay. And I mean, large for a spaceship, not that large for inter interplanetary bodies, so I accept that. I accept a 15 mile long spaceship. So Ash, uh, I know I gave you a pretty robust description of, <laughs> of Transformers more than meets the eye. There are there are other Transformers comics that are like, I, I suppose more in line with like what somebody would expect where they're just like raw action. But mm -hmm. in general, the IDW stuff tends to be like more thoughtful than it is big dumb action. Uh, yeah. I've noticed that with some of their other things. I remember that from some of the Silent Hill comics they published years oh, ago now. How were those? I always saw them on the shelf, and I was like, you're not Silent Hill. Stop so lying it, about being Silent Hill. They fall along a spectrum. Like, some of the ones that I've read are pretty good. Uh, oh, Lord, I can't remember the name of the one now, but 
that's not very helpful. But <laughs> I, I know that there is an image of a girl with like her arms spread out and there are these zombie nurses behind her. That one's pretty good, as helpful as that is. But uh, I know that some of the others weren't so great. Like, I guess the downpour comic was kind of bleh. Yeah. And there were some that were just kind of, they definitely, fe- they, they kind of fell on the gimmick of Silent Hill, kind of like falling on a sword. They just kind of let that be the only thing about them. Versus the other ones, were, there were some that were pretty good. But they were definitely more thoughtful than they could have been. Uh, Ash, uh, Mikhail1032 here in the chat has said, that the new Transformers game looks way better than this. Mikhail, I, I would certainly hope so. <laughs> because this, <laughs> this game, is game... Yeah, this is this is an 11-year-old game that is running on 15-year-old hardware. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I would expect... You're playing, this... it, uh, you're playing it on a PS2 right now. This isn't a modded copy. Oh. This isn't any. This isn't even a backwards compatible PS3. This is a wired PlayStation oh. 2 controller plugged into a PS2 Slim because that's how we do it. Oh, I, that's wonderful. We're oh all, God, we're all Remember. authentic up in here, <laughs> Ash. So what, really? what? What do you look for in a comic? What do you need in a comic book? Because I need, like, I like action as much as the next guy. But I need, I need as uh, as Caleb Xavier here in the chat has described it. I need something cerebral. Yeah, I think that's I think that's probably the case with me too in terms of comics. I also, th- ugh, I mean, really with anything, you need that instant that instant spark of interest. Like I know when I picked up Saga, it just was sitting on the shelf and looked interesting, and I picked it up and started and just like did a quick flip through and the art was just beautiful. So I'm like, I'm going to give this a try. And if I don't like it, well, it'll be the only one I buy. And I read it and it was outstanding because it was so different than most comics I've read before. Right. If it, and that that's from Image Comics if anyone is interested and doesn't already know about it. But uh, it, it was, I think it was that it was so different because when I first picked it up, I was still very used to comics being about superheroes, which is fine. But it was something that I, it, it's all about, like, it's all about family in this sci-fi universe, this really brilliantly realized sci-fi universe. So I think it was just the level of creativity and engagement I enjoyed, like, it just kept pulling me in. And that's been the case with a lot of other comics I've started reading recently, like Wicked in the Divine and Lazarus. It's, and all, about, like, it's all about family and ghost babysitters. Yes, and ghost babysitters who are sawed in half. I love that level of creativity. Brilliant. And I've been trying to... It, it's interesting because I've been trying to read recently... Um, oh, geez. Fables? Yeah. The, the world's longest comic book. And it's fun, but that one... It's tricky because that's also very cerebral, so I'm not sure what it is. But it gets very tiring very quickly. And chatty. Versus... It's ch- Fables is a chatty, chatty book. That might be what it is. It might be that there is a lot, a lot of talking going yeah. on. That might be, versus uh, some of the other comics I read, where there is a lot of talking, but it's interspersed with things blowing up. So, right. or people get shot. It's, it's so interesting to me. Like, you know, I think about, and I am very excited to talk to James Roberts about this, because something that fascinates me about his Transformers comics is that it, it sort of proves that it doesn't matter what your source material is. You can tell an interesting story about anything. There Mm -hmm. is, there there is nothing in the world that can't be used to tell an interesting story. If, if you take a toaster and one piece of wonder bread, you can probably end up telling an interesting story with it. It's all about how you contextualize it and how you tell that story. And Mm -hmm. I find it, like, really interesting that you can have a comic book that has, like, the greatest premise in the entire world, but if you don't tell that story in the way that best suits that medium, it can completely fall apart. I like fables a lot, but I find Mm -hmm. it really inconsistent because I feel like it's dialogue heavy to the detriment of the story a lot of the time. Yeah, I think that's probably the case. And it, it is interesting to see, you know, 
it's kind of it's a huge flashback because most of it, for those who don't know, was written in the '80s during the Cold War. So you're getting a lot of really interesting Cold War commentary, especially because I believe I'm not sure if he still is, but I think at the time Bill Willingham had some very had some thoughts had some thoughts on communism, which Boy. came out. Boy, howdy, did he. <laughs> did he ever have thoughts on communism? But, and it's interesting from that perspective, but it does, get really, it does get really dense very quickly. So you end up kind of setting it down versus... I think, I think it's also a pacing issue. Yeah. Because yeah. I, um, I've also been reading the Tomb Raider comic by Dark Horse, which I love. But one of my biggest issues with it is its pacing. Right. Now, you've described, you've described Tomb Raider, the comic book... Which is written by Rihanna Pratchett, amongst other people. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Is she the only one who's written it? There are multiple writers, I thought, for some reason. Uh, Gail, uh, Gail Simone as Gail, well. Gail, Gail Simone. Simone You've described written. it as a page turner. You've said like it is pretty pretty high octane in in like the most cliche publisher sense of the word. It is. It goes. Um, I believe. The first chapter involves Laura traveling to the desert, and all of a sudden this giant wave crashes down on this travel trailer she's in, and she has to rescue her friend from the travel trailer, and it's like, what is going on? <laughs> so it keeps, you, it keeps you going, but sometimes the action is so fast-paced that it feels, a it feels like it doesn't take any time to slow down. It's gotten better in the second arc. It's now kind of focusing on one story a little bit better. But during the first arc, it was jumping so quickly between these action-packed scenes that it was very interesting, but it felt kind of unbelievable at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of smoothed that out in, this, in the most recent issues, so I've enjoyed it even more. But that was definitely one of the things that kept coming back to me. was like, oh, wow, this is, this is going really fast, and why is she here and then there so quickly? So it's kind of the opposite <laughs> of Fables. Where it went too quick instead of too slow, so it's also finding that pacing balance, yeah. which I feel like is kind of hard with comics because you only have so much space to work with. Yeah, and like the funny thing is, is you you can make something that is is very like incident and spectacle heavy, and have mm -hmm. it work. Uh, early issues of The Wicked and the Divine are a perfect example. Like it's mm -hmm. all style, no substance. Like. Those first five issues are a couple of character sketches and some archetypes and a premise, and it all looks so cool. Like It it's, really does. It's beguiling. And at the same time, I can look at something like Transformers More Than Meets the Eye by, by our guest, who's going to be joining us in just ten minutes. Uh, and it is, like, I swear to God, Ashley, I think that there must be a thousand words per page. Like, it is the most... <laughs> dialogue heavy book in the entire world and the art is like really dense it's it's very like hyper colorful super kinetic and like it, it's it's almost hard to look at sometimes but really all these characters are doing is like sitting around bantering <laughs> and, and yet it is the most arresting thing in the entire world like you can't you can't stop and it's all about just like like you can do those things in comics but it's it it's all about, like you're saying, like nailing that pacing, making yeah. sure that it's doled out in just the right way. Uh, drawing as Musashi is saying, trees t uh, continue to be Optimus Prime's greatest foe. You're not <laughs> wrong, man. That's like, okay, so this game, this, this old Transformers game from 2004 is awesome. I would argue that it is the best Transformers game that has ever been made to date, but the levels are so big that it's not super easy to always know where you're supposed to go and the trees are always very close together so yeah like it would have been it would have been nice if they had added in a uh, a um like a map like if there if there was a mini map in this that would be great but it was 2004 not every game had a mini map in 2004 this oh, is the man. before times. It's the long, long ago. Where I not... remember that. <laughs> what did it? Was it Halo? Did Halo do that? Oh, come on, Ash. It was GTA. Come on. Just it checking. All, it was all that GTA. Okay, that's... Yeah, okay, fair. I'm just used to Halo doing everything, or people claim that Halo did everything. Oh, so Halo. that's just where I go first. Halo, Halo was the first 
uh, the first game to be about a, a faceless man with an awesome armor butt falling in love with a computer lady with an awesome fake butt. That's that's what Halo is first at. That's funny thing. <laughs> I will I will mention this about ha about Halo and specifically Halo Four. Uh, my dad plays a lot of these first person shooters as well. And he, he's very focused on the gameplay specifically and doesn't pay too much attention to the story. So he didn't pick up on any of the weirdness between uh, Master Chief and Cortana until Halo 4. And I was like, so what about that Cortana? He's like, yeah, that was really creepy. <laughs> oh, you focus! <laughs> I'm like, he had to. He had to notice. And in fact, they, they just put it all out there. Just right out there in the world for all to see uh everybody i know where i'm supposed to go i apologize that this isn't the most visually arresting gameplay in the world but i'm having trouble getting there all right hold can on not... maybe i could just go through this water no wait this is a terrible idea optimus prime doesn't like water does optimus made prime... no optimus prime doesn't like water don't go in the water he doesn't like it <laughs> I'm kind of tempted to see how much he doesn't like it. Oh, he but... really does. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take note that the 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 millions of years old sentient robot will die if he goes into a stream. I mean, he is electric. I mean, what killed the wicked witch? I would say, Ash, that we're looking at more of a situation of Optimus had just had lunch. <laughs> he, he just had like a hot dog and a thing of and a thing of Pringles, and he just got, he just yeah. went got right in the water. His dad said, "Don't get in the water, don't go swimming, until you've had some time to digest." But Optimus Prime was like, "No, my friends are playing Marco Polo right now. I gotta get in the water, Dad." <laughs> and, like I should have listened. And and he should have listened. He should have listened. He had his super soaker already. And he should have just gone in the clubhouse and played ping pong instead of getting in the pool. I uh, know, right? See, we've all... Ash, we've, we've got all... a we've got a great premise for a Transformers comic right now. We've got a whole thing. <laughs> we got a whole thing right now. It's called Optimus Prime's What I Did on My Summer Vacation. <laughs> Pitch it to IDW. It's gold. So, yeah, IDW, get ready. Get ready oh. for the hottest Transformers pitch. Oh, son of a bitch. I keep falling off Machu Picchu here. It's really not going well. Uh, Real, qu <laughs> Real quick. I will. I want to apologize to Hoblon. I'm just now seeing this. Lara Croft. My bad. Anyway, go on. Oh, yeah, you do. You tend to I said that. Laura. Yeah. I said Laura. I you're, did. I, I done wrong. You're a Lara, Lara Crofter? Lara Croft. I get anyway. yelled at because I always say Lara that's you always say Lara. Lara. Lara Croft. Uh, I, Lara. <laughs> I, I, Lara. 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 <laughs> not Laura. Lara. Not Laura. Okay. Lauer. Matt Lauer Croft. There we go. We got Perfect. it. We got it. We, we <laughs> nailed it. We're we, Americans. We say everything wrong, don't you it. know? Ash, why don't why don't you read superhero comics? I actually read one superhero comic. Are you ready to hear what it is? Knit laid on me. I read Matt Fraction's Hawkeye. All right, that doesn't count. I no. I know. He, is <laughs> he even says he's not a superhero in the comic. Does not count. That doesn't count. That's that's you. You are currently reading, like you're you're reading almost all of the hipster trifecta of comic <laughs> books. Like it's oh, Saga, God. Wicked and the Divine. It, if it was still running, Matt Fraction's Hawkeye. I'm not. I'm not criticizing that. I think it's awesome. I mean, I, I love them because they're not too well. I guess why don't I read traditional superhero comic books? Is probably what you're asking. Yes. Involving people who do more than shoot arrows. Right. Um, I think probably the main reason, and actually, uh, one of my one of our Games Radar's editors, Dave Roberts, expressed similar opinions about this. It seems like anything that happens in a superhero comic is really inconsequential because you know it's going to be undone right. very soon in the future. Right. And even if you really enjoy something from a certain comic, 
you know it's going to be taken over and probably changed drastically. Like, I really enjoyed, um, oh my lord, oh no, his name, I forgot his name. Oh, I feel bad. The the writer for Lazarus who also worked on Wonder Woman. Brian Azzarello? No, his name starts with a G, I think, or his last name does. Oh uh, no, I'm going to have to look this up. I have to, it's going to drive me crazy. <laughs> I, I can think of... I'm trying to think, like, who's... So many people have written Wonder Woman. By the it's way, true. what do you know about the creation of Wonder Woman? Oh, I actually 30s? know quite a bit about that. Isn't that the best story in the world? <laughs> yes, it is! How, ba how basic... I, and again, I'm terrible with names, apparently. I can't remember the creator's name, but how... Yeah, the husband, the husband like, and wife team. Yeah. Oh, it was... Okay, it was told to me that it was just the husband. No, 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 no. That doesn't no. surprise me. That that's how it was communicated. I would, I could, I could believe that. Yeah, husband and wife team of psychologists who wanted a feminist icon for the 20th century, and who was, were really into bondage. Yes, <laughs> we're super into bondage. So into bondage, man. And to the point, I actually uh, studied Wonder oh. Woman, and you're you're gonna be jealous. I took a class in college. That was a superhero, all superhero comics. That's all it was. Oh, awesome! Because I found it fascinating. I found it fascinating, even if I'm not a, even though I don't read them a lot because of the issues I have with them. The class sounded fascinating, and in fact, it was. It was a uh, taught by Ben Saunders, who's actually written a book on it. I don't know if you've heard of him. No. But, but he exists, and he gives talks sometimes. He gives talks about uh, superheroes and such, but. The, what he did was he went through the early the early issues of Wonder Woman and found all the sequences where she is for some reason tied up and defenseless. <laughs> yeah. And it was basically every single issue. Yeah, pretty at much. Least once. Yep. Oh, and Hoplon42 is pointing out that the the uh, wife's good friend uh, was also instrumental in the... God, I wish I could remember these people's names. Well, I know. James Roberts when he comes on in a couple of minutes. Uh, very oh, crap. Oh, Optimus Prime, I also, no. <laughs> I heard that they were very into polygamy as well. Yep. Like, it, that might be incorrect, but that was what I was told. No, no. When Ho when Hopla42 says his, his wife's good friend, I, I'm using... If I weren't busy messing up in this game so badly, I, I would be using the air quotes to say okay. th that good okay. friend. Because... Okay. I think that they were friends with, um... They were, yeah. they were very good, lifelong, very, very good friends. Very good friends. Sharing all, sharing everything. They were, they were, they were best pals forever. But, uh, oh, I found it! I free Greg Rucka! No, Greg, Greg Rucka, yes! Yes, oh my god, I'm gonna feel bad because I've met the guy, and I totally forgot his name. But uh, he did a really awesome Wonder Woman comic. And what I thought was so good about it was what Wonder Woman was combating wasn't just some monster or, you know, the villain of the day. She had written a book and was telling the story of her life. And someone was trying to combat her because they thought she'd just been given everything. Oh. So they wanted to make her look bad in the eyes of the public, which sounds stupid, but it's actually really good and really thoughtful. And because it was so different than what I was used to from superhero comics, I loved it, but it was cut short for the new 52. Oh, that's such bullshit. It was See, so sad. Yeah, at like, oh man, the new 52. That's, that's a whole right? thing. Right? And then it just, whole thing. ugh. And, that, and that's the kind of thing I've gotten used to from superhero comics is even when you have something so good like that, it can so easily be shut down and replaced with something not nearly as good which doesn't happen as much with other sorts of comics because most of the time they're independent. Right. So you get that exchange of authorship in the same way. Well, so you know what, Ash? I think I think on that note, it is time to bring in our our our, our man of the hour, James Roberts, and he can tell correct. us what it, what it's like to actually go about trying to make uh, games like this. Uh, you know what? We can sit here. We can sit here and criticize, but he can tell us from the inside. I'm I'm sitting here. I don't see him online. 
Oh, there we go. Alright. Add. Add people to this call. Oh, you know what? I'm a dummy. <laughs> Technology. We are recorded again. Technology. I need I, I need my keyboard. <laughs> hey, you know what I can't do? I can't enter somebody's name into Skype if I don't have a keyboard. There we go, everybody. Good thing I was wearing pants on today's stream. Which is <laughs> not, not always so. Not always a guarantee, everybody. Not always the way it goes. Jay Roberts. And I'm definitely agreeing with Duke right now. Indo I think that's one of the bonuses of independent comics is you don't have that kind of person hanging over you making corrections and be like, no, that character can't do that. Right. So that's really a lot. That's a lot of it as well. Mr. James Roberts, do we have you on the line? <laughs> I think you do. Yes! You do. Yes! That is, that is thrilling. I like it when I've things it. work. I can like, see <laughs> almost instantaneously that's that's my favorite thing in the world uh ladies and gentlemen if you are just joining us right now welcome to this week's i got next uh games radars weekly talk show wherein we talk to people who have absolutely nothing to do with video games or at the very least they're they're very you tangentially know? related to video games you, you have found the right person yeah well we <laughs> we, we found a person who at least is involved with characters and and things and similar activities that take place uh, in the yes. world of video games. Today we are talking to Mr. James Roberts, who is the writer of myriad uh, comic books, uh, but is primarily known for his ongoing comic at IDW Publishing called Transformers More Than Meets the Eye. Hello, James. Hello, hello. Oh, I'm very glad. To, to be here because I nearly wasn't. Oh, what happened? Why why weren't you but almost was, here? But there, there was like a Ferris Bueller style rush to get to my desk um, over across the island with with hilarious but um, but unrepeatable instances incidents. But I made it. Did that did that I, song at the end of Ferris Bueller play in the background? Where like what was it like? Bow bow chicka chicka down absolutely, bow. Absolutely. That plays. That plays whenever I, I, there's any sort of deadline or, uh, or or clock to be in my life. That's, I, I, yeah, I can imagine that's really motivating. Yeah, yeah absolutely. For the first for the first few hundred times, and it starts to become, you know, uh, vaguely threatening. Hey, I can see, I can see, I can see a human, and yeah. I can see a, a frog, a stuffed <laughs> frog. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. So, it, it, uh, unfortunately, the camera feed doesn't go through to the stream on my end and Skype. So I basically have to tell the camera to only do one thing. So what oh, okay. J James is seeing, uh, yeah, you're seeing the stuffed frog. The stuffed frog, James, I'm not gonna go into crazy detail, but let's just say that I might play a, a fantasy sports with my friends, and that frog might be sports commentator Bob Costas in a series <laughs> of comic okay. books that I make in my spare time. Okay. That's neither here nor there. That's neither here nor there. We're going to talk about you, not not the weird smoke stuffed animals that smoke cigarillos in my home. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's what it's got in its mouth. Got it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, James, tell I, I was trying to do the elevator pitch for Transformers more than meets the eye to okay. Ashley to try her and sell her on trying out trying out the book earlier. And, and the one sentence pitch that I have for it is it's a political drama and romance about what intimacy and faith mean to immortals who have been alive for millions of years but are recovering from a period of warfare that defined their species. That's very good. And it's also <laughs> the tagline of the original animated movie. So, yeah, it fits... <laughs> <laughs> that was that was what was there in 1986. That's that's what they ran with. Was it what the right thing to do? Well, we don't know. But yeah, and it took up a lot of space on the poster. But no, I, I like that. It's um, you, so if that was an elevator pitch, people would about halfway through be trying to get out the elevator. But, exactly. Yeah. Uh, no, it's. Good. I thought you were going to say something like Justice League International 
you know, meets Arrested Development um, and and Dark Star or something, which are some of the some of the um, references, some of the context uh, that we that we gave in the first issue to try and to try and entice people. Yeah, that yeah. is actually that's very very accurate. See, but like here is my thing. You know, it doesn't matter if you tell somebody that that's literally what something is. If there's no matter what, still, I think for the general audience who are most familiar with these characters, there there's a disconnect there. That is that's still a, a tough thing to swallow. How how the hell did you come to a place where these were the stories you wanted to tell with these characters? Well, I I think it I think part of the trick was was not to be too not not to have settled too much on the on the aims and ambitions at the beginning of the series. So first and foremost, it, it obviously needed to be entertaining to other people. If it was just me that was entertained, that wouldn't last very long. So it had to have an appeal um, to Transformers fans, but obviously to people outside the fandom, um, you know, comics fans generally, uh, and people that like good stories. So it had to be um, accessible. Uh, it definitely had to have a sense of fun to it. And I remember way back in. Um, well, 2011, when we were preparing for the for the launch, um, and I'm I'm not saying it's it's it hasn't been done many times before, and that's partly why it's useful. But the you know the nod uh, to the cover of Justice League, Justice League International with with you know the crew, sort of the ensemble, you know, looking up and Guy Gardner there with his arms folded, you know, sort of breaking the fourth wall. So we did that with we did that with the Transformers uh, with the more than meets the eye cast. And um, you know, it, w it was hopefully getting across um, in an instant that this was an ensemble book, which you didn't really have with Transformers, not explicitly, not 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 mm -hmm. um, you know not promoted as such. Um, and it also didn't take itself too seriously. And when you know, when when we hopefully gained people's trust and said, look, you know, you, you don't need to have done your homework. Um, we do have a, have a bit of fun with this. Then we could use the format to slowly tell more um, more well more disturbing. Um, more challenging stories, perhaps about about the impact of you know four million years of war right. on on a pseudo immortal species and things like that. So you know, and, and we, we once we had readers with us, we could delve a bit more deeply into the world building, into the society and the politics. Um, and, it, and it's a it's a virtuous circle because as people respond to that positively, you know, it encourages you to do more and to take more risks and to be bolder. And, and you know, I, I you know I'm encouraged to do that by IDW and by Hasbro. So we're all good. See now, I, like I understand that, like there's there there is that that way that you can invite people in. You'd be like, let's have fun. Let's make this seem fun, and we'll we'll automatically tell people visually that there's a broad cast of characters, and there's mm -hmm. there's things that will be familiar to them, as well as new things before we sort of get to the hard stuff. But that's still like, it's a weird trip from that premise to. Deciding to explore Megatron not as a giant gray toy that turns into a pistol, but as mm. a poet and and this thoughtful leader worn down by years of war. That's that's a that's a weird journey. So, you know, mm. how how did you start sort of laying out how you were going to explore this this very odd thoughtful lore while still keeping it light? Well, I think I was I was fortunate in a sense. I mean, a lot of this stuff just you know the the, the extent to which I was lucky. Um, you know, we, we can talk about that. I mean, it's it's some of it was by design, some of it was just um, you know serendipity. But the the the, the first solo uh, Transformers story that I wrote after collaborating with Nick Roach on on Last Stand of the Wreckers, uh, the first solo story was a two-parter called Chaos Theory, and it was it was it was intended as a fill-in. Really, it was it was a going to be a one-off. It became two issues within. The uh, within Mike Costa's um, Transformers ongoing at the time, and uh, so it was my first solo gig on, on, on Transformers, and um, I was just lucky in that um, at that point in the story, Megatron was a prisoner, and I thought you know I'd, al I'd always had that uh, had an ambition to do like a two header between Prime and Megatron, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know one, it's a captive, he's a captive audience. It was an opportunity to have them go head to head and to really explore. You know what made them the people they are. Now, you know you, you'll know there's been all these different iterations of the Transformers franchise over 30 years, and you know periodically 
uh, things are rebooted or, or you know or, or refreshed or whatever. And you know the IDW G1 universe um, back in 2011 or 2010 with Wreckers wasn't that that old. It was still exploring, uh, and there were still gaps to fill and, and you know bits of the canvas to paint. And at that point, we hadn't really looked at what made Prime and Megatron tick in the IDW universe. And so there was a lot of unexplored territory, which I was uh, thankfully allowed to sort of get at. And so those really, that, those were the foundations for a huge amounts of the Megatron storyline today in, in, in More Than Meets the Eye, sort of season two. Um, so yeah, I was lucky that, that, that those, you know, the first story tied into the, the, the bigger story that came about when it was decided that, you know, let's shake things up a bit and have Megatron after uh, the Dark Cybertron crossover, have Megatron uh, renounce Decepticon or the Decepticonism really, and um, and become an Autobot. So you know, I could I could revisit some of those themes that we started exploring back in in, in 2011. So, how explain to me the the sort of process for you know getting all of these stories off the ground? What is how how do you pitch your stories to IDW? and the rest of the sort of creative teams there working on Transformers? And how do you guys coordinate with Hasbro? I would imagine that they, uh, you know, in my head, I would imagine that they're pretty uh, controlling because the, this is still a very successful line of toys and there is, there is, I think, yet another new cartoon and there are the Michael Bay movies. You know, they, I, I would imagine they want to keep a firm grip on things. But it seems like you kind of have a lot of freedom. Well, yeah, this this is the bit where people watching or listening, are, are, you know, they'll they're going to be really skeptical, and they'll just think I'm, I'm sort of being a, a, a yes man and, and sort of saying, oh, you know, Hasbro are pretty uh, Hasbro are relaxed about it, and they they give you freedom and they let you do your own thing. Um, but that is that is very, very nearly always uh, the case, and uh, I think I think it's because um, you know, thank God, we are we're 30 years into this franchise. It's a really mature franchise in both senses of the word you know it's been around for a long time it's had a multiplicity of, of, of iterations and continuities um, I mean at any one time these days you know you'll have a you know you'll have a, a branch of the Transformers universe that's aimed at you know uh, you know well at one point preschoolers really but you know y young kids um, and then you know slightly older kids teenagers and then you've got you know my demographic people that grew up with it in the 80s um, and I, I don't know I, I, I suspect no, in fact, I'm, I'm wrong. I was going to say that I think a lot of people that read more than meets the eye um, are sort of, you know, in, in late 20s, 30s. But who knows? Actually, I think it's bringing in a lot of younger people, which is great. Mm. But, but I think all of that gives um, gives Hasbro the confidence to think, okay, well, look, there's there's multiple audiences out there. Um, that, you know, that their needs can be catered for in different ways, and the the brand and uh, yeah, the franchise is is strong enough and supple enough to support, you know, more. Uh, you know, or different styles of storytelling. So yeah, no, so it's all good. And, and yeah, there'll be there'll be times when um, you know, um, Hasbro is still making the toys, and there are um, toys which are I think particularly aimed at um, people who appreciate Generation One. You know, the the um, Combiner Wars is the latest example. And um, you know, as it's always been, there's an opportunity. You know, there's the toy, there's the comic. Um, let's let's you know synchronize them up. Let's 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 have the toys appear in the comic. So that happens from time to time, but not in a way that um, you know that takes precedence over the the bigger storylines, which which John Barber um, on Robots in Disguise now, just simply the Transformers um, is telling, and uh, Megrade Scott on on Windblade, and now it's going to be Tool Order One. That's another ongoing. So you know we um, we do have creative freedom. Um, we do have notes from Hasbro, and obviously I have notes from from IDW themselves. Um, but by and large, um, there's a lot of creative freedom, and I think, particularly with more than meets the eye, because of the the uh, the hook, um, you know, it's a quest. They're, they're they're advancing into space, exploring new territory, getting progressively further away from Cybertron and, and the rest of the uh, the cast. Um, that in itself sort of creates like an inbuilt freedom, really, a, a separation uh, and a distance um, from the rest of what's going on, which. Which largely benefits me because um, you know I'm sort of trusted to just keep pushing them out there uh, in the in the lost light and keep telling those stories. Now I'm going to get a little into spoiler territory here. If there's anybody watching that wants to jump into the book and not know anything, close close your ears for a second. Plug up your ears. This is only going to last a second. Ashley, I want to tell you how weird this book gets. 
Like, okay, I, I'm ready. I, I try to explain how weird you get, James, to people, and I don't, I don't <laughs> think that everybody always appreciates it. In a recent issue, I shit you not, there is a bunch of Transformers sitting with each other, trying to figure out how to save the life of their friend while sitting in the living room from Friends. The sitcom <laughs> Friends. Yeah. Like, this very is... intentionally, the, uh... The, oh! The... It's explicitly the living room from Friends. Now, <laughs> like... Now, wait, is, it the one, is it the one in the apartment where the duck lives, or the one across the road from Ugly Naked Guy? Oh, the one it's, it's that one, yeah. It's, it's Monica's apartment. <laughs> yes. It's, it's yes. Monica's apartment. Go. And, like, I, I'm sitting there reading this. Now, now I'm not going to spoil why they're there. There is actually a very fascinating character reason <laughs> why, they're, why they're there. But, like, James, is there... You can get that into an issue of mm. More Than Meets the Eye. What... Has there ever been anything that you have pitched to your editors where they have said, absolutely not? No. Um... um, 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 um. There's been a couple of things that I've... Because believe it or not, I do, I do have, you know, sort of... A, I do have a sense of boundaries and, and, and limits, and, I, and there was a couple of things I, I didn't, I didn't take beyond the idea stage, um, which I may yet sort of, sort of come to, come to, you know, I may find a way to bring them back in, in the next uh, season, so to speak. Um, the only real um, sort of rejections, if you like, from uh, from John Barber at IDW were, to, were not to do with the sort of weird and, and, and unusual high concept stuff, but more more to do with some of the, um, you know, the sort of the stuff that was just really, really dark. Um, mm. And, and and it wasn't, it wasn't a case of you know James, it's too dark to do, um, you know in and of itself. It was a case of you know, that particular situation speaks so ill of those characters that you know it's just it doesn't fit, um, which is which is good advice and John was right. Um, but no, I mean I, I the the friends issue, um, was was issue forty three, mm. you know so that was a that, I wouldn't have done that in issue three. You know, you sort of—I I like to think you sort of earn the trust of of, um, of your readers, and uh, and that you know. But when you're into it, the the forties, um, people get to know both the characters, obviously, but also the, the sort of uh, the sort of rhythm of of the of the series itself, and they'll know that okay, this month we've got a, a sort of rather very bizarre uh, sort of done in one one off issue, um, which has a bit of fun. Uh, maybe it's got a more serious point, but you know, superficially, it plays with the form a bit. Um, and then, you know, if, if that isn't quite the thing for me, then next month there'll be something else, um, maybe more traditional or more serious. And, you know, we, 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 I try and have fun uh, and keep things fresh and in terms of, you know, the, um, the length of the stories. They tend to be one or two parters. Um, I really like a variety of settings and, and setups and, and concepts. And, you know, I really do like to see how far we can stretch certain things. Um, I'm pretty sure that with the Friends issue, some readers thought, okay, that's too far, um, and actually the issue, the story before it as well, um, you know, spoilers, uh, involved um, sort of a very high concept uh, villain, or monster, really, monsters, essentially, that, um, that fed off charisma, and, w uh, and yet themselves were so unassuming, they were, they were socially invisible. So it may be that the sequencing of those issues, you know, three very out there issues in a row, uh, was too much for some. Other people. James, I, 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 that that entire idea of the the creatures who consume charisma, but are so sort of like blank that you know people won't notice them even when they're right in front of them. I guarantee you that like Stephen Moffat and the entire like writing crew of Doctor Who was like, damn it. Why didn't we come up with this? How is that not ours? Uh, there's actually a question. Uh, Kale in the chat was asking, IDW has the rights to Doctor Who as well. Maybe a crossover? God, Maybe? yeah. Well, yeah. Um, well, they, they, they've lost the... Well, they don't have the rights anymore. It's gone, gone to Titan Comics. But, um, but even so, if there was a way to, to do it, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big Doctor Who fan. Um, you know, and, um, and I, can, I think... Um, some people say this, well, this is good. Some people will say it's not. But I mean, there, there's there's sometimes sort of elements of Moffat's writing um, in 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 More Than Meets the Eye. Somebody once said that um, that they they thought More Than Meets the Eye was a was a synthesis of, of of Stephen Moffat and Russell T Davies, which is a 
a huge compliment uh, as far as I'm concerned. But um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to waste the opportunity to tell some some very different stories because you know I've, I've really got it on a plate. I've got I've got a, a cast a, a cast of characters, an ensemble cast that um, that I love and that people have come to like. Um, we're on a spaceship. We're 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 jetting off into the unknown. It's it's sort of got a spine to it. It's a, it's a quest, but really. It could be an adventure of the week as well. So you know, let, let's really run with that and um, and exploit it. What you know? How did you start as a writer, man? I like. I know. I. I you're a very difficult individual to research, uh, from a journalistic <laughs> perspective. Uh, you know, uh, if it's not Transformers related, it, it, your writing career is is a bit of a mystery to me. I know yeah. that. Uh, you know, like that. Last Stand of the Wreckers and a lot of that stuff was the beginning of your tenure with IDW. I also know that at one point, once upon a time, you actually wrote a Transformers-based novel that was just for your own edification, right? <laughs> or, or, well, yeah. So, well, hopefully there was a, a, a wider audience, albeit not a huge one. Um, yeah, it was called it was called Eugenesis, and just before we just before I did the Ferris Bueller thing and crashed into this room and you know set it all up, then somebody tweeted to say that. Um, it was on. It was on eBay. Eugenesis, the book, was on eBay um, until about 20 minutes ago, when when the time when the um, the time ran out. Because um, it's unofficial. Um, it was done back when you know I was uh, myself and a, and a group of like-minded fans. It's fan fiction, you know, and we, we'd swap stories. And Eugenesis was sort of the the climax of my you know uh, fan fiction endeavours. I really wanted to to sort of get it all out there. And because you know um, I'm pretentious. And so on. I thought, well, let's 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 make it into a proper book. Let's let's pay for it to get properly bound. Um, didn't make any money from it. That wouldn't have been appropriate. But um, I did about 150 copies and sold it at, at a convention. And that was 15 years ago, more or less. Um, and 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 really, the reason you haven't, you know, the reason I don't leave much of a footprint in terms of writing is because you know, until until the Transformers gig came along, you know, there was uh, the stuff I did wasn't writing related. It I, I had other I had different career. That I, that I did, and it wasn't involved. Didn't involve scripting, so um, yeah. So this is. It was very nice, actually. It was like a parallel universe. Your introduction, where you credited me with lots of non-Transformers comics and uh, and other stuff, which you know, I, I was happy to let that let that stand because you know, that's. Not, that's <laughs> See, but I'm I'm curious about like you know what, uh, writing is a tempestuous act, man. It is not easy. It's very very hard. It takes an incredible amount of discipline. To get anything on the page, and you know, I, I'm curious about where you started. Like, what drew you to to start writing in the first place? You know, and and I, uh, mm. you know, before you you were writing Transformers fan fiction for with your pals, what mm. were you writing? I was I was writing really um, <laughs> um, self consciously deep stuff about. Um, I was I was really I mean as a teenager um, and and you know into my twenties I was really uh, into um, things you know authors like John Updike and um, uh, God, God, and Philip Roth and Graham Greene uh, Martin Amis and so on um, and um, and the Go Between uh, was was a huge favourite of mine and I sort of had these these delusions of of sort of literary grandeur and grandeur and I'd sort of spend a long time. Just writing all this um, stuff about. I did something called the. Uh, what was it called? It was. It was. It, the, the working title was the Strawberry Thief, which all, it, you know, didn't have many huge fighting robots in it, um, or, or or friends uh, pastiches either. But it was that sort of that sort of thing. I also did. I did. I, now now it's coming back to me. I, I did do you know non Transformers comics as well. You know, to, to for my own edification. Um, but again, they were all sort of very. This was when Arkham Asylum was out, and and you know everyone was very serious and took themselves very seriously. And um, see now, it, it should be contextualized for for anybody watching. Arkham Asylum, as James is referring to it, is not the video game where all the <laughs> Batman characters look like they're covered in juice or Vaseline. Uh, <laughs> with, <laughs> Ash, can you explain that to me? Why is everybody always wet in um, Batman Arkham Asylum? Everybody just shiny. got back from the gym. They have to be shiny so they stand out from the black background. It doesn't make sense to me. No, James James is referring to Grant Morrison's 1989 graphic novel uh, of the same name, 
which is uh, deeply disturbing and still a hell of a good read. And mm. and you're not wrong, James. Uh, you, you mentioned pretension. That is a pretentious book, and it's probably <laughs> one of my favorite things on the face of the planet. Yeah, I know. Yeah, those two things can go together. You know, you can be pretentious and, and fun uh, or, or, you know, entertaining. But, yeah, that was a big influence for a bit. And, and actually, even... even um, you know, I think when when More Than Meets the Eye started, in you know, those that were familiar, the, the tiny m number of people that were f familiar with me through Chaos Theory or Wreckers, um, probably didn't expect something which was as superficially uh, light-hearted um, as as More Than Meets the Eye, because you know Wreckers was very dark and violent. Um, we, yeah, we, we we sort of you know shafts of humour in it, but very dark and violent. And Chaos Theory was was a very serious sort of. Uh, examination uh, of, of these two characters. So, yeah, so More Than Meets the Eye was a different tone um, and, and marks, you know, a, 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 a great distance between what I was doing in the, in the 90s for, for myself, um, writing-wise, and, 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 and now. Mm. I'm, kind of, I'm kind of curious. I'm curious, I'm curious if, you curious think, if you, think, you think... It seems like a lot of things like this, a lot of things like Transformers More Than Meets the Eye, it seems when a lot of writers come at these things, they try to make it super dark so people pay, pay more attention, they take it more seriously as a way to say, this isn't just a show about toys. I know, actually, when I was a kid, I loved Digimon, and they went that route and got super dark, and it was very strange. Digimon and got dark? It did in season <laughs> three. They murdered one of the protagonists. It was really bad. And I wonder if, like, <laughs> That's the way that some writers feel. The only way some writers feel they can draw people in and kind of push away that kind yeah. of oiness, I, I guess. I think there's a, yeah, I think there's I think there's something to that because um, what we're seeing, of course, you know, you've, you've got these um, increasingly long-standing brands uh, or franchises, a lot of which, a lot of um, a lot of them originating in the '80s, and so as we said before, you know, the the hardcore original fan uh, fandom is you know in their in their thirties now. Um, and this would this would equally apply ten years ago, you know. But they, they they sort of reach adulthood and they still like these things. But on some level, for some people, there's maybe um, a misplaced sense of sort of guilt or shame or whatever. It's ridiculous. And and the, t to compensate, you know, they they uh, when they get the opportunity, they reimagine these things and and, and bring out the sort of the, uh, the the dark side and they make it super mature and and um, and you know maybe sometimes it works. Uh, but I, I think it speaks often to a lack of confidence uh, in the material mm. and what made you fall in love with it in the first place, you know? Um, I mean, I, I don't, don't know anybody connected to, to, to this title. Uh, it was a few years ago now. But, you know, that I, I was recently shown the, um, I think it was Wildstorm's Thundercats um, mm -hmm. miniseries on one of them. And, and that, is, that is, exemplifies what we're talking about from my perspective. That is some very disturbing stuff in there. Um, mm -hmm. And um, you know, I yeah, um, it, it didn't. It uh, as sort of a, a sort of casual fan of Thundercats, it didn't. It didn't do it for me. But um, but you know, more than meets the eye, and the other stuff that I've uh, the other the other titles that IDW put out, um, I think strike a good balance between you know between the fun stuff. Um, but you know, none of, none of the creators are afraid to tell um, you know very um, you know ch challenging stories um, which explore. Uh, you know, m mortality and morality and politics, um, and like I said before, you know, the characters in the universe, the continuity can sustain that type of thing. So I'd hope it's like the best of all worlds, really. Yeah, you know, it's really funny. There, I I find no phrase in, in all you know all of the many mediums that genre fiction appears now. You know, uh, whether it's video games or novels or movies or cartoons or anything. You know. Or freaking like Dixie cups, like that are sitting in your bathroom and have little comics on the back. <laughs> I, I, nothing is more tiresome to me than hearing somebody say, "Oh, it's dark and gritty," you know, yeah. like dark, yeah. and, especially when they're in conjunction. It's just like, ugh, yeah. please. Uh, I think that's definitely one of the things the Bay movies suffer from. Right. In addition, to other things. In addition, in addition to blanket racism. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> rip, rip a. Sound wave in half. It's like, was that necessary? <laughs> was that, was do, that you, essential? Do you, do you think people, do you think there's a shift away from that finally? I mean, I'm thinking of, um, you know, shows which have sort of like a pan generational appeal, like Steven Universe. Oh, yes. Um, yes. And, and, you know, and some of the, and particularly, particularly on the Marvel side, some of the, you know, the Squirrel Girl uh, and, uh, and similar titles, which, 
you know, they they're not going down um, the the dark and gritty path. You know, yeah. nor, nor are they nor are they always light. I mean, they're not they're not at all um, insubstantial or frothy. But you know, they uh, they they seem to get the tone right, and it seems to strike a chord with a newer generation of readers and, and viewers that that don't need that sense of strange validation that they're that they're watching something which is ostensibly for children. Um, yeah, but but it's okay because it's really actually um, disturbing and, and very dark. It's none more dark. It, it, yeah, James. I, I think like a. I do think you're absolutely right. I I do see the tide turning. Now I can't remember what I was reading the other day. Uh, I, I think it I think it might have been a, a web comic or or something along those lines. And you know somebody was talking. To, it was, a, it was a, a 40 year old adult talking to a teenager hmm. and the adult was trying to you know sort of be snide and snarky about something and the teenager is like why are you doing that and the, hmm. the 40 year old says is an irony what's cool and the kid says no man you're old sincerity is what's in now and <laughs> I, I, I was like oh my god it's true <laughs> And it's yeah. the most refreshing thing in the entire world. And, I, you know, I, I, I think that that spirit uh, that you were describing in, you know, something like Steven Universe, which has mm. a lot of cross-generational appeal, and, you know, also uh, Adventure Time, and Transformers yeah. more than meets the eye, frankly, sort of taps yeah, into I that vein. So. Mm -hmm. I hope so. I, I really hope so. That would that, that, be hugely... Um, complimentary if someone said that to me. It, oh, I love it when you know you're at a convention and you know you've got well children full stop. Any any kids there? It's great to see you know fresh blood um, for the fandom. But you know when when a when a, a, a mum or a dad come along with their child and you know let, let's let's hope for one moment that they haven't just been coerced into being you know a fan. But let's assume it's 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 a love of the of the franchise that's happened naturally. That's really good to see. And you know when when I'm, I hear about um, mums and dads reading. More than meets the eye to their kids. I do sometimes think, well, okay, well, how old's your kid? But um, yeah, uh, I, yeah, I wouldn't read it. To, I mean, I, I wouldn't read it to my four-year-old. Um, but yeah, um, that's good. It's great. And I, I, I'm all for that. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about fandom. Let's let's talk about how you came to this. You know, you you said you grew up with the Transformers in the '80s, but you know, there are a lot of people that. But, you know, staying a fan of something for a really long time can mean a lot of things. It, you know, it can mean like, oh, I, I got a, I got a T-shirt, and I, I like, you know, Optimus Prime. Or yeah. you, you could be like the folks who are in our chat right now and are, are like, tell us stories about the Quintessons. Like that's, you know, yeah. I don't, I don't think anybody watching right now thinks that's a deep cut. But like, Ash, do you know what a Quintesson <laughs> is? Don't that... put me on the spot like that. Don't... <laughs> I'm just illustrating how deep of a cut that is. Like, that is just, deep. It's deep cut. It's you know. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's it's a giant skull tentacle monster that might or may or not may or may not have created Optimus Prime. Anyway, they torture people. Don't worry about it. Okay. okay. Cool. But like. Yeah. <laughs> They, they, weren't, they weren't on. They weren't on that many lunch boxes in the eighties. I mean. Not. They were not. I can't why. <laughs> they were not lunchbox regulars. They they hung out. They hung out with uh, a giant purple robot that that was Leonard Nimoy in his heart. Uh, but <laughs> so like James, how how yeah. how did you come to Transformers? You know, like yeah. was it just the uh, action figures? Was it the comics in the eighties and nineties? What was it? It was the. Um, Oh, I'm, gl I'm glad you said '90s. That makes me feel young. Um, yeah, it was the '80s. Um, it was. Um, it was. Well, it was. It was Blitzwing originally. It was. It was. It was. A, it was a birthday present, um, and I, I came to it late. I mean, it was, it was my tenth birthday, so you know. And this was this Blitzwing may, means. It, well, that was okay. Let's be specific. That was that was 1986. So um, you know, I missed. I missed. Yeah, there we go. Do the maths. So we'd um, we'd missed the first two years. I'd missed the first two years. Um, I wasn't really into any toys actually. God, what a boring child I was. I probably just sat there and, and did maths or something, or I don't know, painted <laughs> stones. There wasn't much to do in, in, in the island. But I just, yeah, I think I just used to sort of sit on tarmac and uh, feel the sun's rays or something. I don't know. Anyway, um, so I had Blitzwing, and that was great. He was great. Um, but it was the it was the comic. It was the British 
Transformers comic, um, which which really um, got me hooked. That was my sort of gateway drug. And um, you know, for, for those for those who aren't familiar, um, you know, in, in the UK in the 80s at least, there was just it was weekly comics everywhere. So you know, not not the, it was that was the default frequency. Um, 24 page weekly comic. And Transformers uh, started in 1984 as a comic um, because because of because of its regularity. Its frequency, and um, there wasn't enough American material to, um, you know, which American stuff was coming out once a month. You couldn't stretch that over four issues. So very early on, the UK, uh, Marvel UK, um, commissioned original British uh, stuff to put in the weekly comic, and um, and the British, and it was all one big story. So the UK stuff and the American stuff was all sort of interweaved, and uh, it was the comic was a huge thing for for, for boys and girls in, in the UK. You know, it, it was, I think that one one of um, I think until Sonic, uh, in fact, it was the longest-running uh, licensed property or you know toy property title. So you know seven and a half years, um, and it was the comic and the stories in the comic that really pulled me into it. And um, you know the toy range in the UK. Actually, the toy range in the UK has never never stopped because you know I know in in, in America it, it ended in sort of ninety one, um, I think, if not nineteen ninety. Uh, yeah, and then they did Generation Two. <laughs> yeah, and in between that, in the UK and Europe, you had you had the more G1 toys to bridge the gap. Um, but you know, I grew out of the toys uh, and not and not the not the comic. And um, you know, I got back into things with with the you know, I mentioned in Genesis and, and the fan club. Um, you know, like my comic other comic fans really. That was the that was what kept me interested. Um, and then actually even that, even that really sort of just, you know, petered out of its own accord. So by the mid nineties, you know, I was very fond of Transformers, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a collector. Um, there weren't any comics then anyway. Um, I was aware vaguely of Beast Wars and Beast Wars was fine, it was good. Um, but you know, it was sort of on the periphery. And uh, it wasn't really until, um, you know, Eugenesis and then it went quiet again. And then until, you know, when IDW, um, when an opportunity arose through Nick Roach um, to work for IDW, that I really took an interest in, in in Transformers again. And the point of this long anecdote is that, in some respects, I think that the the um, the, the, the sabbaticals might have been quite useful to me actually, because you know it just sort of, it gave me a sense of distance, which um, I think can be quite helpful sometimes in 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 telling the type of stories I think will be entertaining and not. Being tempted to, and I'm not accusing anyone else of doing this, but not being tempted to sort of say, ah, oh, you know what, fans love this character, or that's a good toy, or that was a good Japanese toy. I'm going to stick them in that issue, and and that in itself will be enough. You know, that will be that will that will tickle some people's fancy. It's a strange British phrase, I presume. Um, that will tickle their fancy, and and that's it, job done. Um, but the distance uh, from 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 the, from the franchise for a bit, I hope. Um, you know, sort of strengthened my writing muscles and, and made me look at them as stories. The modern ACI is used as stories first and foremost. You know, with a beginning, middle, and end structured appropriately. Yes, they've got Transformers in, and yes, they absolutely are about Transformers. But I can never use that as a crutch, and I can never re rely simply on um, that sort of, um, in many cases, that sort of nostalgic connection to Transformers. That value judgment which says Transformers are in themselves brilliant. Therefore, a comic with them in is halfway to being brilliant already. So I can't, and I don't, assume that's the case. It seems that there is something to that, though. You know, there, there does seem to be something inherent, maybe not in the, the individual characters, although you do see, you know, characters like Optimus Prime, like, this is, this is a pop cultural icon, you know? Yeah. Like, that is a, yeah. that is a, a, you know, object just that body, that head, that, that oh, yeah. look, that's that's very yeah. iconic. And, like, that's endured. But there's something about the premise in and of itself that seems to be e exceptionally powerful, and people respond to it. But, you know, like, when I sit there and I, I try to intellectually break it down, I have trouble. You know, like, in my head, I can think to myself, well, it, you know, there's it's alchemical, you know? It, yeah, it's, it's seeing one thing turn into something else, and that's that's magic to people. But then I I can't like I, you know, and if there's anybody watching who cares deeply about them, I apologize for what I'm about to say. I can't for the life of me figure out why those movies are so popular. 
I can't. Oh. They're mindless. <laughs> They're totally my. I, I remember going and being like, well, okay, I can watch this. But that'd be my interpretation, at least. But, like, they're, they're mindless, like, you say that, but, like, I love the Fast and the Furious movies. I find them incredibly entertaining, but they're not, like, three hours long. Like, the Transformers movies are, like, Ten Commandments is a shorter movie than those. <laughs> and I, I, I just, I'm not sure I, like, so, yeah, what, what do you think it is? What, why do people respond to this in, in droves? Oh, that's, a, that's a good question, um, and it can't all, all be put down to, you know, certain people of a certain age, because it's bringing in, you know, the, the, the concept is bringing in, in new, new fans. I mean, I guess, I guess people are going to come into it and become fans through, diff people are going to take different paths, and for some people still, for a lot of people, uh, it's still going to be the toys, and it's going to be the toys, you know, that you have as a child. And what, what I find, um, I was going to say bemusing, that's not what I mean. Um, what I find, what's, what, what surprises me, because, you know, I forget about aging and stuff, is when, you know, at conventions, um, you, you'll get talking to, to proper adult people, you know, they're not like five, um, so time has passed is my point, um, but, you know, they're adults now, and they, they, were, they got into Transformers through Armada, or through, you know, Cybertron or Energon, and, you know, these things just barely register, because I was, you know, I was doing other things, and I, and oh, yeah, of course, you know, things... The toys kept being made, and, and, and you know, new fans are being brought in, and now they've grown up and stuff. And, and what's happening to them is exactly what happened to me. So it's regenerative, and, and it brings in new fans through the toys. Um, and I guess you know there will be there will be people who, you know, for whom the the Bay movies tick the right boxes, and they may not have been Transformers fans, you know, before, but but they are now through the movies, uh, and similarly through the comics. I love to think that there are people who read. Um, the IDW titles uh, that, that hitherto didn't care at all about Transformers, and the, yeah, the, those books were their gateway into into the fandom. But you know, but taking a step back from all of that, um, you know, we're sort of. I'm not necessarily saying that there's only so many ideas in the world, but I think you know, there's only so many really big, high concept stuff uh, ideas, and you know, massive transforming you know m mecha. Um, you know, Transformers sort of owns that in in many respects. I know, I know. There's, there's, you know, Japanese mecha is, is a huge thing of itself. But um, you know, Transformers are really dominant in in that in that field. And um, and because, as I say, they're so durable a concept, um, they're going to stick around and they're going to be adapted and it'll be reiterated and relaunched. And you'll keep bringing in new people. Um, but I am struck by how iconic Optimus Prime, in particular. But even you know, Soundwave, Soundwave, probably Soundwave's the second one that people would would say, oh yeah, yeah that's the second. Yeah, yeah. And then um, like, and then like Bumblebee. I would yeah, say. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, and, and certainly Bumblebee's coming up on the inside now, thanks to thanks to the movies, and his success, his prominence in the movies has led to his prominence in in different you know continuities now. So Bumblebee's coming up on the inside, and then you know, yeah, you even get people like you know Starscream and Shockwave and stuff that um that that that, that are somewhere. For people of a certain age, that they they're on the pop cultural landscape, um, and once they're there, generally speaking, Prime's a good case in point. It's it's just going to become entrenched that they they sort of stick around. Um, but it's great. I mean, it, it it means clearly we can keep telling stories. You know, the the umbrella is broadened. You can do different. You know, you can have different computer games, different movies. The cinematic universe is going to be expanded. There'll be like three hundred and nine films a month or something like that. Um, <laughs> And every single, I mean, I, I very much hope that every single um, story that's ever been told in Transformers is going to be, you know, ruthlessly cannibalized and put on the big screen so that eventually we can get to Wreckers and, um, and, and the rest. So, yeah. Do you, have, do you have aspirations to that? Do you have any interest? Because I know that, that there, there is, like, the cabal of story managers for the Transformers movies and they're, they want to start doing it, doing it up Marvel style and making yeah, a billion uh, different things. Do you want to write one of those? Do you have interest in doing Oh that? yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, for the, for the many, many people watching that have got influence in that regard, yes, just unequivocally, <laughs> yes please. Um, I was, I was going to be part of that, but, um, but Donald Trump got the job instead, which is strange. You know, he, they, they drafted him instead. Well, I mean, everybody knows that Donald Trump is a hardcore Skylinks fan, man. He he will not. I mean, that's his one. If you, I mean, I was um, 
you know, I wasn't convinced by Trump, you know, not to get political, but then, you know, he wore his Skylinks badge and, you know, he had his Cosmic Carnival t-shirt and I thought, maybe, maybe there's more to this guy than <laughs> I thought. He sold you, man. He, his he, his yeah, fan I'm credentials were I, there. I can see why he appeals to that. Um, not that it's my country, but, you know, <laughs> it appeals to that part of America that's really big on Skylinks. I think that's, that's the takeaway from this. It is in our country. Please help. <laughs> Send it. So, Ash, um, Ash, are you convinced? Are you, are you like, you know, listening to this, would you go and add Transformers to your poll list? I think no I pressure. might. <laughs> I think I might. might be a, I might. I think I might be a little lost because I wouldn't know enough, but I'd still be interested to at least check out the first volume, see well. if I can keep up and then be like well, I'm glad oh. to hear that Ash because you know for all I know you're the only other person listening to this and you know 45 minutes I've, I've been focusing on, on convincing <laughs> you to try it out oh um, and just just so you know because I don't think you can see the stream chat one person did say that more than meets the eye it was their intro to Transformers so you have one fantastic. at least fantastic thank you yeah Thanks, I, think, I think I'll check it out because I do love I mean and before you came before you uh, came on, I was talking about how I love Saga and Wicked and the, Wicked and the Divine, and those are very kind of silly in that genuine, sincere way too. So I'm like, why not? Yeah, go, that's, this is good. I'm pleased. Okay, well we can we'll we'll compare notes when you when you've made it through Volume One. Volume <laughs> One, fantastic, jumping on point. You know, <clears throat> actually, frivolity aside, um, the IDW universe was given sort of a soft reboot. Um, <laughs> in 2012, you know, or the end of 2011, where, you know, the, and, and for those people, uh, I don't know how many there are, who are listening that, that aren't into the, haven't experienced the comics uh, in recent years, um, the big thing that happened uh, at the end of 2011 was that the war finished. So, you know, to my mind, I think the, fir the first time that's happened um, in a serious way um, in, a, in, a, in, the, in the history of the franchise. So end of 2011, the war was over, um, and here we are now, nearly at the end of 2015, and the war is still over. And so we've had um, a good few years exploring what that means, uh, what post-war life mm -hmm. means. So, so yeah, Robots in Disguise uh, by John Barber and, and More Than Meets the Eye, um, they, they sort of chronicle, well, for the first couple of years anyway, after the war ended, they chronicled the fallout from that. Um, and then more recently, Windblade, um, and, and it will become Tallulah 1, you know, is another title that uh, that tells that story, but um, so Volume One of More Meets the Eye contains the issue that explains the war is over and what happens next. So that's the I'm, I'm looking at you, Ash, but really anyone that's listening, that's that's the one to go for. Oh, that sounds great, and I I do love stuff, like, and not to get us too off topic, but I do love stuff like that because I feel like in any form of media post-war is not extensively covered. It's always the war till the end. Right. Post and post-war is a very unique time. So yeah, it's, absolutely. I, it's interesting to actually see something with that. So I think I like the sound of that. Oh, good. Okay, excellent. One one person at a time we're going to do this, okay? <laughs> wow. <laughs> one at a time. So, James, you know, I, I'm going to go out there and say that I, I you know, I, I think I, I, I spoke too soon when I said quintessons are a bit of a deep cut. Uh, <laughs> because FARC 111 here in the chat has asked the deepest cut question that I think I can imagine for Transformers, which is, will they visit a planet that involves the KISS players? <laughs> no, they will not. <laughs> Ash, Do I want to know what that is? No, you don't. Oh, okay. uh, Ash, imagine... Now let's let's talk about the pervious impulses in Japanese pop culture that you can imagine. Oh, so this isn't Kiss the Band? Oh, no, no. no. <laughs> Kiss Players just... is one word. I, I wish it was. <laughs> it's a noun. And, um, you know what? Yeah. I, I'm only familiar with the toys. I have seen these things. I don't know if there's, like, a story justification for what the hell is going on there. That, that, the story justification may have been somewhat secondary. To, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't, think, I don't think that's what they were. I don't think that's what they were going for. But Ash, uh, like it would be like you go and you get yourself a you get yourself a Megatron action figure, right? 
You get uh -huh. yourself a Megatron action figure, and then the Megatron action figure comes with, or is supposed to also be? I wasn't essentially clear on this aspect. Regardless, Megatron comes with a tiny... What looks like an anime teenager wearing lingerie. No. Yeah. Yeah, that's a real thing. No. <laughs> that's a real you sort thing. Of, you, can sort of, you can sort of imagine the uh, the discussions around their creation and someone saying, you know, it, it makes sense. No, it, of course it's, it, it makes sense. And I, I, I'm not really, yeah, I'm not really familiar <laughs> with, with, with them beyond the, um, the rather... Um, arresting premise yeah the, so. the, uh, yeah I, I remember god it, years ago that is that is such a deep cut because in, in my head that's a contemporary thing but now i'm realizing that like <laughs> i was in college when those things were around and i remember seeing the box art and thinking to myself oh man that's got to be photoshop that's got to be <laughs> like i i was like that's got to be a joke and then i was doing and this is still an annual tradition uh, looking for a Generation 1 swoop on eBay. I think I'm showing my cards here as to, as to yeah. what kind of fan I am. Uh, <laughs> but every now and again, I, I do that. I still do that. I've never been able to find one that's affordable. And the more that time goes on, the less affordable swoop becomes. But oh. I, 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 was, I was sitting there on eBay and going through Transformers stuff. I guess this was like 2003? Probably, and lo and behold, there is a, a Kiss Players oh. Transformer, and I'm like, oh my dear God, why, <laughs> why? Reality. See, I was, was kind of so hoping. You think, you think the uh, sitcom issue of More Than Meets the Eye is weird in a world that contains Kiss Players? I, <laughs> I, I don't think so. Well, it's yeah, it's 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 the fact that the Friends issue is so soulful that seems. Oh so surprising to me it's the fact like, like good catch <laughs> yeah it, it's it's the it's the existence of your take on a character like cyclonus that i find fascinating like cyclonus is like ashley cyclonus was a guy who was created to just be like a, a new toy in 1986 he was the muscle for leonard nimoy in the in the Transformers movie, and he's a really cool looking toy. He's a big like airplane spaceship thing, and he's got like horns, and okay. a, and a, he's got a robot goatee, which is a whole thing that was really popular in 1986. Apparently, everybody yeah. everybody had robot everyone had a, had a robot robot goatee. Uh, of course, but yeah. I mean didn't Bender had a robot goatee? Yeah, that was make evil. That a little Bender. later, but he did. <laughs> But yeah, you know, James, you, you took Cyclonus and were, decided that rather than a rather than a robot goatee, it was here, here's a guy who has been alive forever and ever, remembers what life was before the war, but you know, lived life defined by conflict, and now what the hell is he? And that's that's a fascinating character study to me. That's that's a that is that is weirder than Kiss players <laughs> to me. Yes, but yes, I think Kiss players are. Um, yeah, there, there's not much beyond the uh, the disturbing um, <laughs> concept. Right. Um, but yeah, thank you. No, thank you. I. I, uh, I mean, I suppose it goes without saying, but I mean, that, it's it's the it's the cast itself which I hope which which which, which I hope make make the book. And um, you know, if people aren't aren't invested in the characters, if they, if they don't want to know what happens to them. And if, if they don't feel a, an affection towards them, some of them at least, then, um, you know, a, the connection with the book generally becomes much weaker. And, you know, you might better buy it out of habits or, you know, or you might find it easy to stop buying if, you know, um, if you don't really care what happens to the people you're reading about. So, um, and it's quite a big cast as well. I think we, we, we've got 16, 17 um, characters that could all lay claim to being, you know, the A-listers in the book. So, um you know, we, we try and give each of, them, each of them their own space and, and, and a spotlight from time to time. And that in itself lends itself to the rather sort of episodic, um, well, the on one level, more than Meteor is very episodic, but then there's sort of a, a substrata which is, all, you know, very connected and it's all about, you know, season arcs and then series arcs and things. Um, but all the time, the constant is the, is, is the people that you're reading about. So what, what you know, we've, we've got a few minutes left here. And, you know, I want to make sure that I ask you at least one more softball. Uh, 
Oh, oh thank you. No. Uh, wait, the, 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 the actual softball, and, you know, it's, it's, it, I find this question to be almost as noisome as, where do your ideas come from? But I'm, get, I'm dead <laughs> curious. What do you want to write besides Transformers? You know, when, when somebody comes to you and says, oh, well, you've got this book and it's doing really well. We want you to write something else that isn't about giant yeah. immortals. Uh, what do you want to work on, man? Um, well, not to be facetious, <laughs> but something which isn't about giant immortals, really. It would be something I think I, I, I'd like... There's lots of things I'd like to do, actually. I'd like, I'd like, yeah, my own sort of creator-owned stuff, which is, which is a million miles away from Transformers, just because, you know, Viva la Difference and things, um, which is probably much smaller scale, <clears throat> much smaller scale, still character-driven. Um, maybe elements of science fiction, maybe not. Um, I'd like to do that. Um, in terms of, of sort of licensed characters and franchises, I mean, you mentioned Doctor Who before. You know, do, doing a Doctor Who comic would be great. Um, being in any way involved with, with Doctor Who, the series, would be phenomenal. Um, I'd like to do some children's books. Uh, I'd like to do some prose stuff, which, you know, I was into the prose before scripting comics, so I'd like to get and return to that. Maybe not as, as insufferably pretentious and try-hard as my stuff in the 90s. Um, but, yeah, do a bit of that. And, um, and I'd really like to get involved in, um, in TV work as well, some script work for TV. Um, so a few avenues to explore, um, some more realistic than others. But um, yes, it's uh, it'll be fun. Um, it'll it'll be fun to do, to do other things alongside more than it's CI. James, maybe you could get back to your roots in multiple ways, man. You can you can go and you can do fan fiction for the the Run Rabbit series. You get get some updates <laughs> fan fiction. Oh yeah. Yeah. Some, <laughs> yes. Some up, yes. Okay. I'll, I'll do a I'll do a comic book adaptation of of, of the Rabbit trilogy. Yes. I, I would want to read yeah. that. Yeah. Kill me. Okay. Oh, oh. there's your first. <laughs> Pointing. Ah. Trying to point. But there. Him. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, we we are just about to shut this beast down. Uh, if you have enjoyed today's show, please click that little follow button. At the, at the bottom of the player. It's that little heart that will let you know when we go live. Uh, it's a real commitment. That means we'll be together forever. Uh, oh. I'm lying, but, but oh. please click it anyway, uh, because we love you and we love when you watch. Uh, we have great, great stuff coming up. Uh, Ashley is going to be back tomorrow on our weekly show, Departure Lounge. Ashley, what, what are you guys playing tomorrow? Uh... Something Did weird. I say I have no, something weird. It's I have no idea. Weird. That's the, that's the name of the game on Departure Lounge. Is we have no idea what we're getting into. Yeah. So, so that's, that's that's that's, that's tomorrow. It's six thirty p.m. Eastern time. If you come back on Thursday, and if you are a fan of Mega Man, we are playing a really really cool co-op game called Twenty XX with the developer. It's going to be weird, so you can get to talk to them next week. We're going to have on. Naughty Dog hanging out with us to talk about uh, the Uncharted collection and hopefully we can grill them about uh, how the KISS players Transformers are going to show up in Uncharted 4. Uh, I just made that up, but a boy can dream. Uh, Best you, <laughs> works. You, you, can, uh, you can also follow uh, Mr. Roberts on Twitter and James, I, I'm an idiot. I can't remember your handle right off the top of my head. Would you please let the fine people I, know what that is? I, I, I would better check, actually. I think it is. I think it is J, it's at jroberts332. There you go. And there you, go. Uh, you can also you can also read James's fine comics. Just go online. You can get them. You can get them through the Transformers IDW app yep. if you have that. Or if you like, if you're like me and you like killing trees, you can go to a comic shop and and go yeah. buy issues of Transformers more than meets the eye. James, thank you so much for joining us today, man. Uh, oh, thank you very much. It's been it's been more than a pleasure. It's gone very quickly, which is always you know a good sign. <laughs> I hope it's gone quickly for your for your listeners and your viewers as well. <laughs> See, now I'm disappointed. I want this to be grueling. I want this to be a trial oh. by fire for everybody. Oh, I'm sure the, the scars will, you know, make themselves known after, you know, but I mean, I'm fighting back the tears. Um, I feel sick. 
So, uh, you know, when we, when we log off, I'll just go and, and, and crawl into a ball and weep. So, you know, I hope you feel good about yourselves. There we go. My job, Perfect. my job is done. Uh, <laughs> Ashley, thank you so much as well. And everybody, again, you can have Ash here tomorrow uh, for Departure Lounge. And we'll see you then. We'll see you on Thursday. The schedule is up on your screen now.